Um, I would like to first <coughs> I would like to first thank um, Justin for the kind introduction, and thank you, um, thanks uh, Rafael, Justin, and Doris for being here with us today, and thanks the meeting organizers. Corey, Carl, and Mitri for organizing such a wonderful meeting and uh, selecting me for presenting today's uh, Larry Katz lecture. So it is my great honor and pleasure. So I've learned a lot about Larry from an advisor, Lee Chun Luo, who was a student here uh, for the imaging course uh, at Cosmic Harbor 20 years ago, and this course was taught by Larry. And according to Lee Chun, Larry was a wonderful teacher and, a, and also a fun person, as you can already see from this picture. So Larry has made pioneering contributions in many areas of neuroscience, from vision to affection, from circuit development to tool development. And his seminal work has encouraged, has continuously encouraged and inspired young graduate students like me to pursue the most fundamental questions in neuroscience. And it is my great honor to have this opportunity to appreciate Larry Katz and uh, to appreciate Larry Katz and uh, appreciate his pioneering work in studying neural circuits. So for many animals, including flies and mice, the sense of smell is their primary means to find food, seek mate, and avoid danger. <laughs> so the olfactory system allows them to perceive these different smell and make appropriate behavioral responses. So following the work of Richard Axel, Linda Bach, and others on the characterization of olfactory circuit organization, Larry was one of the first to look at the functional responses of smell in the mammalian brain. Larry and his colleague look at the functional, look at the neural activities of, um, the, of odors in the mammalian olfactory bulb, which is the first olfactory processes in the brain. And they look at their responses to different odorants, for example, the smell of banana or the smell of peanut butter. Very interestingly, the smell of banana or peanut butter activated different regions in the mammalian olfactory bulb, and this really opened the door to study the functional mapping of odor information in the mammalian olfactory system. So in order to understand how the odor information is encoded in the brain, we need to first understand how the olfactory system is organized and assembled. So here I would like to use the fruit fly Drosophila to, as an example, to illustrate how the olfactory circuit is organized. The antenna and the maxillary pulp are the two external sensory organs for affection. Olfactory receptor neurons, or ORNs, are the primary sensory neurons that are located in these two sensory organs, and they express odor receptors to detect odors in the environment. Very interestingly, the axons from the same class of ORNs converge onto a single glomerulus in a structure called antenna lobe. Within individual glomeruli, axons from ORNs make direct connections with projection neurons, or PNs, which are the second order of factory neurons. And PNs that receive information from different populations of ORNs send their axonal branches to higher brain centers. So in flies, there are 50 classes of ORNs and 50 classes of PNs, and they make one-to-one -one connections in 50 glomeruli. And we refer to this one-to-one -one connection as PN-ORN matching. So this direct connection between ORNs and PNs allows the delivery of older information from po different populations of ORNs to higher brain centers. So how do higher brain centers distinguish, distinguish different odors? Two former postdocs in the lab, Greg Jeffries and Chris Potter, analyzed the axonal projections of different classes of PNs in higher brain centers. And each color here represents one of the PN classes. So you can already see that different PN classes occupy different regions in one of the higher brain center, the lateral horn. And very interestingly, P the PNs that process fruity odorants and PNs that process mating pheromones 
target to different, to spatially segregated regions in the ventral horn, suggesting that food and sex may occupy different part of the olfactory brain, and this may presumably may allow the animals to distinguish the smell of banana, for example, and the smell of mating odorants, mating, mating pheromones. So this precise organization and wiring of the olfactory system allows the delivery of specific odor information from a particular population of organs to a specific region in the higher brain center. And in terms of the circuit organization, olfactory system from flies to mammals share a high degree of similarity. Mitral and tufted cells are the mammalian equivalent of projection neurons, and they make one-to-one -one connections with organs and send their axon axonal branches to higher brain centers. And the direct connection, direct one-to-one -one connection between RN and PNs is a common feature in both uh, the olfactory system in both flies and mice. Um, so how neurons are assembled into neural circuits is a fundamental question in neuroscience. And the olfactory system represents a very nicely, very precisely organized neural circuit and can be served as a model system to study this fundamental question. And in particular, we would like to understand how the RNs and PNs form one-to-one -one direct connections in the antenna lobe. So although they share a high degree of similarity in terms of the circuit organization, flies only have 50 pairs of RNs and PNs, whereas mouse have over 2,000 pairs. This makes flies a simpler model system to study this wiring process. And in addition, fly has other advantages, including having shorter life cycle and having a large collection of powerful genetic tools. So today I would like to focus on the Drosophila olfactory circuit um, for the rest of my talk. So we would like to understand how PNs form direct connections with our axons. And let's first look at their developmental process. So it was shown that the circuit assembly could be divided into two distinct phases. In the first phase, PNs send their dendrites to the antenna lobe first before the arrival of OR axons. And PN dendrites can further elaborate and target to specific local regions independent of OR axons. And in the second phase, OR axons arrive at the antenna lobe and make one-to-one -one connections with the postnaptic PNs. So the question of how PNs make connections with ORNs can be divided into two smaller questions. How PNs target their dendrites to appropriate local regions, and how PNs and ORNs form final connections. <coughs> Presumably, when PN dendrites and ORN axons reach the vicinity of the antenna lobe, they need to interact with the local environment and other neurons around to, make, uh, to determine where to go. The cell surface molecules that are uh, expressed in those neurons are usually the key players that mediate this process. So in my thesis work, I decided to uh, focus my efforts on finding cell surface molecules that directly mediate these cellular processes. Today, I would like to first summarize a story I completed in the first part of my thesis work to address the first question. And then I would like to focus on a recent finding to address the second question. So let's first look at how PN dendrites target to appropriate local regions. So previous work from our lab has found an important rule of a cell surface molecule called semaphorin-1A and you form a molecular gradient in the antenna lobe and direct dendrites to rough regions in the antenna lobe. So after semaphorin sets up a gradient in the antenna lobe and direct dendrites into rough regions, the neighboring dendrites that are located at a similar level of semaphorin gradient still need to be segregated and target into this great identifiable gramelli. So having just one gradient along one axis is clearly not enough for this discrete formation of the structure. So what, how do PN dendrites <coughs> get segregated into different identifiable gramelli? 
we found that PN dendrites also need a local binary determinant called capricious, or CAPS in short. And CAPS is a cell surface molecule that is present at different levels in neighboring dendrites, and the different levels of CAPS specify where the dendrite should go. So shown here is a developing antelope stained by a neuropeel marker, and this was done at the developmental stage when axons and dendrites are in the process of being restricted into the identifiable individual granuli. We used antibody to stain the endogenous caps expression and found caps is differentially expressed at different granuli. For example, caps is strongly expressed in one granulus here, but weakly stained in a neighboring one. Shown here is a diagram summarizing the different granuli in the antenna lobe, and you can see the CAPS positive granuli showing gray. So the CAP expression is not a gradient like semaphoring, but appears to be an intercalated pattern that differs between neighboring granuli. Once we saw this differential pattern, we immediately hypothesized that different classes of PN may use different levels of CAPS for targeting to specific granuli. So we tested this hypothesis by labeling single PNs in the entire animal and change the level of caps in the single PN. So the lab developed a technique called Markham, which is a genetic tool to label a single cell in an entire animal. This, techniques, this technique also allows us to remove a gene or overexpress a gene in the single labeled cell. So here, we use this technique to label a single PN. Here is the cell body. It sends dendrites to this granulus. And based on our expression analysis, this single PN is positive for CAPS expression. And we use Markham to remove this gene from this single label PN and found the dendrite partially mistarget to other granuli in the antenna lobe. And the quantification shows that the dendrites does not that do not mistarget randomly, but rather mistarget specifically to ectopic granuli that are, mo mo that are mostly caps negative. So you can see dendrites mistarget from gray to white. We also tested overexpression by labeling another single PN. And it is normally caps negative and since dendrites to this granulus. And we also use Markham to overexpress a gene only in this PN and found the dendrites mistarget to other granuli from caps negative most to mostly caps positive from white to gray. So both loss of function and gain of function analysis suggests that caps gives each class of PNs a binary code and switching this binary code alters the, the targeting specificity. For example, from gray to white in loss of function, and from white to gray in overexpression. And this suggests that CAPS regulates the targeting of different dendrites into intercalated granuli. So the discrete CAPS code work together with continuous semaphore ingredient towards the formation of the discrete granuli and these occur in the first phase of the circuit assembly. So you can imagine that a few more such global gradient and local um, uh, discrete code can further specify the targeting specificity of all 50 PN classes. And it will be interesting to identify those additional molecules that are involved in this process. And now I would like to switch gears to talk about the second phase, how PNs and ORNs form final one-to-one -one connections. So one can hypothesize that this could be achieved through two alternative mechanisms. In the first mechanism, PN dendrites and ORN axons may target independently and precisely, and they can somehow register with a common coordinate system to finalize ma their matching without mutual recogni recognition or interaction with each other. Alternatively, 
the dendrites and axons may mutually recognize each other and interact with each other to form one-to-one -one connections. So the following evidence favors the second mechanism. In this experiment, a pair of PNs and ORNs are labeled in two different colors, PNs in green and ORNs in blue, as shown in this schematic. When a cell surface molecule, ds is overexpressed only in PNs, it causes the dendrites to miss target to a neighboring location. So now what happened to its presynaptic ORNs with the ORNs target itself to its original location or follow the, the mistreated dendrites to the new location. So it turned out that the ORN axons follow the mistreated dendrites to the new location and thereby maintaining their connection specificity. And this suggests that ORN axons may use uh, cues on partner PN dendrites to mediate some sort of recognition and these cues on peer dendrites mediate this axon, match, axon dendrite matching mechanism to ensure their proper connectivity. So what are the cues that mediate PN or in one-to-one -one connection and matching? So one can imagine that a pair of PNs and ORNs may recognize and communicate with each other through molecules expressed from each side. And if uh, they, if they express the same molecule, they may recognize each other and form connections. If we can express this molecule in another class of PNs, we may be able to force this new pair to form ectopic connections. And this actually provided us a very nice strategy to search for candidate molecules that are involved in the cellular process. So we use this idea to design two genetic screens. So in order to visualize the proper matching and mismatching between PNs and ORNs, we label here both PNs and ORNs simultaneously in two different colors. And just to mention that in Drosophila, PNs are named after the grumeli they innervate, and ORNs are named after the odor receptor uh, they express. So in the first screen, we label a small subset of PNs that innervate two grumella here and, and co-label another class of, uh, a class of ORN that innervate the adjacent grumellas. So shown here is a single confocal section showing you green dendrites and red axons, and they never overlap in the wild type. So in the screen, we overexpress the gene only in PNs and look for the ectopic connection between PNs and ORNs. So we are particularly interested in transmembrane and secreted proteins because they are likely to be the key players that are invo directly involved in this cellular process. And in Drosophila, we have um, a large collection of transgenic lines called EP lines that allow us to overexpress genes one by one. And I screened 410 transmembrane and secreted proteins using EP lines that were kindly provided by uh, Professor Kai Zin in, in Caltech. And these molecules cover about 40% of the cell, cell surface molecules in Drosophila genome that are likely to be involved in cell-cell interaction. And among these molecules, we identified a molecule called 10M, and in its overexpression, cause the dendrites to make ectopic connections with all our axons. So now you can see an overlap between green and red, which you never see in the wild type. An alternative way to perform a screen is to look at an endogenous pair of PNs and ORNs. So here, instead of labeling a class of ORN that innervate the adjacent grumellus, we label another class of ORN that innervate the labeled PN. So now you can see a complete overlap between a green and a red in this circled region. And we overexpress a molecule in PNs and look for the, uh, the disruption of connection between PNs and RNs. Among the molecules we screened, we found another molecule called 10A, and it is actually from the same protein family as 10M. And in 10A overexpression, 
dendrites and axons only partially overlap with each other, and part of the red axons is not co-localized with green dendrites anymore. And this suggests that 10A overexpression led to a loss of connection between P and SNORNs. I would like to emphasize that P10M and 10A are unique among the 410 transmembrane proteins because they are the only two that cause mismatching phenotypes. So what are 10M and 10A? So they belong, they belong to a family of evolutionary conserved transmembrane proteins called tannerins. Tannerins are type two transmembrane proteins with a large extracellular domain. And tannerins are highly conserved from worms to humans. 10M and 10A are the only two members in the Drosophila tannerin family. So in order to understand the potential function of tannerins in the olfactory system assembly, we need to first examine when and where tannerins are expressed. So antibody against 10M and 10A shows that they are differentially expressed at different glomeruli. For example, 10M is strongly expressed in these glomeruli, but weakly expressed in this one. 10A is strongly expressed in these two glomeruli, but weak in others. If we compare 10M and 10A, we found they are expressed in a distinct but partially overlapping pattern. RNAi against 10M or 10A can completely eliminate the uh, antibody staining, suggesting that the expression pattern we are looking at is specific. So at this developmental stage, the antenna lobe contains neuronal processes from various types of neurons, including PN dendrites and OR nexons, and they are highly intermingled. So with antibody staining, we couldn't tell whether the staining comes from ORNs or PNs or both. So we, we would like to examine the specific contribution of tenderings only by PNs or only by ORNs. So we took advantage of an intersectional expression strategy here. We found a way to genetically access 10M expressing neurons using a GAL4 line. And we used the GAL4 US system to drive the expression of a FLIPAL GFP reporter. Because there's a stop codon here, GFP will not be expressed by GAL4 alone. But when there is a FLIPAS around, it will excise and remove the stop signal. And so the GFP will be only expressed in the intersectional region where GAL4 and FLIPAS are expressed. So we have different FLIPAS lines that are only expressed in ORNs or PNs. So this allows us to examine their expression overlapping pattern between, uh, with the, the GAL4 line. So we first examine the overlapping regions between 10M and ORNs. And we found indeed that 10M is expressed in a subset of ORNs. And for example, 10M is strongly expressed in these two classes, but weak in this class. So we decided to focus on five glomeruli where we have available reagents for further genetic analysis. And in these five glomeruli, 10M is strongly expressed in three of them. We next examine the overlapping region of 10M in PNs. And we also found 10M is expressing a subset of PNs. And in the five grumel that we focus on, 10M is strongly expressing uh, three of them and in a matching pa pattern between PNs and ORNs. So we also use a similar strategy to look at the expression pattern of 10A only in PNs or ORNs. So I summarize the expression pattern of them in this diagram. Blue indicates high 10M, low 10A. Orange indicates high 10A, low 10M. Gray indicates a low level for both proteins. DA3, for example, is high for both 10M and 10A, so it is both blue and orange. So you can see that tannerins are expressed in matching pairs of PNs and ORNs. This matching expression raise the hypothesis that tannerins may act as, a, as how he, he, a homophilic adhesion molecules to mediate the one-to-one -one connection between PNs and ORNs. According to this hypothesis, high tannerin-expressing PNs should match 
with high tenure expressing RNs. And this hypothesis may, pre may predict that if, if we overexpress tenurings, it may cause a preferential effect on neurons with low tenure expression and cause them to mismatch with neurons with high tenure expression. And to test this hypothesis, we use Markham again to label individual PN classes and look at the PN and ORN connections and see whether overexpression can change the connection specificity. Here, I'm labeling a pair of PNs and ORNs that do not form connections in wild type, the PN DA1 and ORN OR47B. The A1 PN normally express low 10M and make endogenous connections with a low 10M ORN and does not make connections with 10M high ORN. If we overexpress 10M in, a, in this single PN, it causes its dendrites to make ectopic connections with ORN axons. This data suggests that increasing 10M level in a 10M low PN class causes dendrites to make ectopic connections with a high 10M ORNs. By contrast, when I overexpress 10M in a class of PN that already expressed high 10M, we didn't see any mismatching phenotype, suggesting that further increasing 10M level <coughs> in a 10M high PN does not change the connection specificity. Likewise, we also examine the expression, uh, the, the, uh, the overexpression of 10A in different individual PN classes. Overexpression of 10A in VA1D, <coughs> a class that expressed low 10A, will cause its dendrites to disrupt its endogenous connections with ORNs <coughs> and make ectopic connections with additional ORNs that are 10A positive. By contrast, when we overexpress 10A in a class of PN that already express high 10A, <coughs> excuse me, and the overexpression does not change the connection specificity as we predicted. So the loss of the Slogina function of both tenurings suggests that they act as self, a homophilic adhesion molecules to mediate the one-to-one -one connection between PNs and RNs. So we also tested the homophilic matching hypothesis in loss of function also by manipulating individual PN and ORN classes. And this time, we perform loss of function. And we also label a pair of PNs and ORN that do not form connections in wild type. And removing 10A from this single PN class caused their dendrites to make ectopic connections with ORN axons, suggesting that reducing 10A level in this single PN class causes dendrites to make ectopic connections with low 10A ORN. So the, it suggests that the loss of function data also is consistent with our hypothesis that the matching expression of tenurings instruct the matching specificity. So I've shown you that tenurings are differential expressed in matching pairs of PNs and ORNs, and their matching expression determines the proper connectivity between PNs and ORNs. So in order to achieve these, tenurings should function homophilically and mediate the direct attraction between PNs and ORNs. So we te first tested the homophilic interaction of tenurings in vitro by performing co-immunoprecipitation. So we first separately expressed different epitope tagged tenurings in Drosophila S2 cells with flag tag or with HA tag. And we mix and incubate separately transfected cells, lyse them, and perform co-immunoprecipitation using anti-flag antibody and see whether the HA tag for tenurings can be co-precipitated. So shown here is the co-IP data and you can focus on the first blot, which is, shows the co-IP result. 
The following plots are the controls showing the proteins are expressed in a comparable amount. And you can immediately notice that the flat 10M can robustly bring down HA10M as seen by this strong band here, suggesting that 10M is capable of forming homophilic complexes in vitro. To a lesser extent, we also observe the homophilic interaction of 10A and also heterophilic interaction between 10M and 10A. So this different strength of interaction specificity may can partially contribute to the connection specificity they mediate in vivo. So to directly demonstrate whether tenorings can mediate homophilic attraction of PNs and ORNs in vivo, we simultaneously manipulate both PNs and ORNs at the same time. So here, I label a small subset of PNs and ORNs, and they do not form connection in well type. And if I overexpress 10M in both PNs and ORNs, the overexpression will cause this particular pair to form ectopic connections. However, when we overexpress this molecule only in PNs or only in ORNs, it does not cause the ectopic connection to form, suggesting that between this pair, the, it is the ectopic connection is unlikely caused by heterophilic contraction between 10M and something else. And this suggests that 10M can homophilically promote the direct attraction between PNs and RNs. We further expressed a presynaptic marker synaptotagamine in RNs and found the synaptotagamine is enriched in the ectopic connection site, suggesting that the ectopic connection likely forms synapses. So uh, to briefly summarize, I've shown you uh, two stories today. Uh, in the first part, the differential expression of caps regulate the discrete targeting of dendrites in to the appropriate local regions. And in the second phase, the matching expression of tenorings regulate the one-to-one -one connections between PNs and ORNs. And it is the homophilic attraction between PNs and ORNs that bring them together and form one-to-one -one connections. So there are 50 PNs and ORN pairs. And uh, in order to regulate the targeting connection specificity among all of them, we need to have additional molecule molecules that work together with tenorings in order to achieve the specificity among all pairs. So another interesting question is whether tenorings are limited in the olfactory system or they are broadly involved in other places as well. So indeed, tenorings is not only involved in the olfactory system. Another a postdoc in a lab in Moscow also examined the uh, neuromuscular junction. And uh, it turned out that 10M also used a similar strategy to regulate the target selection of motor neuron to specific muscles. So here, you are looking at a specific muscle and motor neuron pair, muscle three, and its innervating motor neuron. And normally, this particular pair of motor neuron muscle form connections as seen by this red puncta. However, loss of 10M led to a loss of connection between this particular pair of motor neurons and muscles. Um, and this is also through homophilic interactions. And very interestingly, tenorings also regulate the synapse organization of the neuromuscular junction. So in mammals, there are four different tenorine homologs. And all homologs are predominantly expressed in neurons and different tenorings are expressed in a distinct but partially overlapping in the mammalian brain. One of the tenorings, 103, is required for the ipsilateral projection of retinal ganglion cells to red lateral genuclear nucleus. And in human, 101 and 102 are located in regions that are associated with certain forms of intellectual disability, and 104 is recently associated with bipolar disorder. 
So it will be interesting to test whether the mammalian tenderings also use a similar strategy to mediate the interconnection specificity between individual neurons. So the current work of neurocircuit assembly can be traced back to 50 years ago when Roger Sperry proposed the chemophilic hypothesis. Roger and his colleague observed that after cutting the optic nerve, regenerating axons from a portion of RGCs target specifically to a region in the tectum in an orderly form from ventral to medial, from dorsal to lateral, from posterior to anterior, from anterior to posterior. So Sperry proposed that the cells must carry some kind of individual identification tags by which they are distinguish one from another to a level of single neurons. And that, that, at that time, it was a bold hypothesis. Over the past 20 years, many target selection molecules have been identified that guide neurons to the red area and layers. However, much less is known about how they select partners, especially at the level of single neurons. So actually, it is de still debatable that whether molecules are used to, to achieve the connection specificity of individual neurons at the complex neural circuit. So uh, in the nervous system, in the, in the visual system, for example, afferents and EPH are, are, are found to work together with spontaneous, spontaneous activity to finalize their final uh, connection partner. So the function of tenderings suggests that individual connections can be achieved, can be achieved through molec at the molecular level in a moderately complex neural circuit. So finally, I would like to thank my advisor, Li Chun Luo, for his tremendous support over the past few years. He's a wonderful mentor, and my thesis work couldn't, couldn't have been possible without his guidance and support. I would also like to thank a postdoc in the lab, Tim Mosca, who has great expertise in the neuromuscular junction and did the AMJ work I presented. I would also like to thank the help from other people in the lab, my committee members, and also the people who share uh, us the reagents, and also the entire neuroscience community. Thank you for your attention. Few questions for Weiji. Hi, is there cell type specific expression of different neurons in the mammalian cortex? I mean, is it is the pattern of expression sporadic and sparse? So I think that depends on which tenderings um, uh, they're expressed. So I think people have been examining the expression of tenderings in different uh, broad areas, but I don't think people have examined in a cell type specific manner. So I think it will be very interesting to look at the mammalian tenderings and see whether they are expressed in particular cell type and whether different tenderings are expressed, <coughs> for example, in uh, different cell types and pattern uh, the connectivity and especially the connectivity between individual neurons. That is something that is definitely interesting to look at in the future. So I think, um, so your model is suggesting that it's involved sort of in the final connections, right? And have you then tried to drive expression from to distal glomeruli? I assume that that, can you change matching from a long distance or can you just change matching from a short distance? Oh, so you're asking uh -huh. whether tenderings regulate a global targeting or matching between PNs and ORNs were just a local matching. So in our data, I think most of the data uh, suggests that the matching occurs in a local level and uh, tenderings can only change the connection specificity in a very local range. So. So I guess uh, to follow up on that question, um, so in that case, uh, the is it known that the young ORNs, when they're innovating the um, immature antenna lobe, do they actually sample multiple uh, potential glomeruli sites? Oh, that's a very interesting question. So uh, I guess the question is, during development, whether ORNs or axons naturally sample a small area or a large area in the antenna lobe so they are able to get can, uh, basically um, 
uh, make transient contact with additional or, or with additional PNs that they um, they don't form eventually. So actually, the answer is yes. So we recently did some uh, developmental studies that look at the axon pattern, uh, the, the axonal projection during early development, and we do see uh, transient. Um, uh, uh, contacts and philopodia extending from the uh, small regions, the, the main axis, so the main mass, suggesting that those additional philopodia are the ones that they use to sample uh, the large area, and potentially those are uh, those processes may uh, mediate the, the eventual matching between PNs and orients. Uh, homophilic interaction is enough to uh, induce the matching. So, do you need, uh, you know, intracellular signaling to achieve the, you know, matching? Oh, that's a, in that's the case of yeah, the tenuring. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So, we haven't examined this whether, uh, for example, whether the downstream uh, signaling into the cellular machinery is also involved to, um, uh, to regulate matching. So the, the, the experiment to test this would be, for example, to delete the intracellular domain and see whether the extracellular domain alone is enough to regulate this process. And that's something that is very interesting and is very interesting to look at. Yeah, at this moment, we don't know the answer. Uh, so from your first part, caps play a role in uh, direct dendrites of the PNs to a certain area. So does CAPS also play a binary role in, target, uh, in guiding the ORNs subsequently? Oh yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, CAPS is expressed in a certain classes of ORNs, but the CAP, w in, in our experiment, we didn't find a role of CAPS in ORNs, and um, we didn't, and CAPS is not regulating the targeting specificity uh, between PNs and ORNs, or the connection specificity between PNs and ORNs. And also, I have, a, sorry, I have a secondary question. So you propose the homophilic interactions between PNA and ORN through uh, TM. This, prote this, this homophilic proteins guide the, uh, the synapse formation between them. So uh, is it possible that the uh, different glomerulites expressing the same uh, tenorine protein that can interact with each other? Is there any potential mechanism should make sure they don't con connect with each other, the dendrite itself? Um, so you're asking whether the homophilic interaction among dendrites or among axons, whether it can cause them to fasciculate with each other. So I think uh, in the antenna, they, they are actually very close. So uh, they are actually in a very close vicinity. I think probably the, the, f the, the, the final formation of the synaptic uh, structure will give the specificity of the pre and the post synaptic structure. So I think tenorings are used to uh, mediate the connection specificity between PNs and ORNs, and they probably are not used for uh, uh, determining exactly where synapse to form. So uh, even if PNs and ORNs are very close, there could be additional mechanisms that, for example, prevent uh, synapse to form uh, between the neurons that they shouldn't form. I also had a question about the homophilic uh, attraction model. So you showed uh, that some glomeruli express low levels of both 10M and 10A, and yet they're able to form connections between ORNs and PNs. So what do you think is happening in that case? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So we think that there should be additional molecules that are probably expressed in additional classes, and they probably are the molecule that mediate interaction between them. So uh, that's my hypothesis. So um, it will be interesting to identify those additional molecules. and. These two uh, molecules are basically the first two molecules that we know to mediate interaction between PNs and ORNs, and we don't know those additional molecules yet, so. I guess a sort of follow-up question. Um, do you think there is, are any sort of in mutually inhibitory interactions between, so because uh, uh, so if you have a low level of expression of 10M, why do you not uh, connect to something that has a high level of expression of 10M? So, um, we think that there should be, or there could be certain types of competition between um, neurons express different levels of tenorings. So if, tenu so if two neurons express, both express high level of tenorings, they have a higher affinity to uh, make connections with each other. And so therefore, uh, the, another neuron that 
express lower level of tenurings may have less opportunity to make connections with higher tenurings, uh, higher level of tenurings. So that's potentially some sort of competition may uh, lead to the this uh, uh, spe connection specificity, especially how levels determines the connection specificity. Uh, <coughs> okay. uh, is there any is there any association between the odorant receptor type and the tenure uh, subtype, or they are in the independent? Um, so we think they are independent. So we didn't, for example, there are different sicilium classes uh, for ORNs, and we didn't find any correlation between tenure expression and different types of ORNs or different sicilium type. So that's something that we could be uh, could more carefully look at in the future, but at this moment we didn't see any obvious correlation.